If you have your Bibles, open them up to Daniel chapter 3. i get my notes set up right here. We're continuing walking on uh, through the book of Daniel. We're just kind of tackling the first six chapters. And so uh, we're going to do Daniel chapter 3 today. I was thinking this week a lot about this concept of tension. That's what we're really going to be talking about today. And, and I feel like tension is one of the worst feelings that you could ever deal with. Have you guys ever been in those situations that things just get tense and it just feels like Thanksgiving dinner? Anybody? One of those? One of the first, uh, the first, the absolute very first business meeting I was ever in charge of. I had just been hired on as pastor. I was 20 years old of this little bitty church in rural Tennessee. It's a cotton farming community. On a big Sunday for us, there would be like 23 people. Like that's, that's the biggest Sunday we could have. Like 12 of them are all part of the same family. That's, that's this church. And so we're going to have this business meeting. Now, at this point, I had known I'd wanted to do ministry for like six years. It was what I was really wanting. I was learning theology. I loved preaching. Um, but let me tell you how often I paid attention in any type of church business meeting through that time. Like, I didn't want it wasn't something that pertained to me. I was in youth group. I was so, so I show up. I get hired on as this pastor, and uh, I show up to business meeting, my first ever business meeting that actually like, I'm involved with and I need to pay attention to. And so I stand up, or, or really I sit down, and uh, the head deacon, his name was Chuck, he looks at me and goes, well, pastor, I think it's about time we start. So I have no idea what I'm doing. Uh, so, so I get up, and I say, well, I guess I'll call this meeting to order. I think I've heard people say that before. Um, and I'll open with a word of prayer. And I prayed. And then I said, and uh, Chuck, I've actually never done this before. So would you like to come lead the business meeting? So he comes up and uh, I sit down to the place that I'm, one of the things I love about this church is we have in our bylaws that the pastor is not allowed to be moderator of the business meeting. And I love that. That is, I'm not always a policy guy. That policy I love. So anyway, so, so he gets up and he starts talking. And uh, he gets to the financial report and he passes out the papers and he says something along the lines of, now you may notice we have quite a bit more in the bank this month. And that, they did monthly business meetings. And that's because uh, we recently sold one of our two parsonages. Yes, this church of 25 people owned two parsonages. That's just normal for Tennessee churches. So I don't, I don't know what to tell you there. But we sold one of our two parsonages. Um, so you'll notice that money is, is reported in the finance report. And all of a sudden this voice shot from the back. Her name was Miss Peggy. Um, and she shots from the back and she goes, who approved selling that house? I don't remember ever discussing selling a house. That should have been brought to the church for approval. And so he shoots back something along the lines of, well, I understand that, but we had an offer that was really reasonable and they wanted to try to move it as quickly as possible. So I thought we might as well go ahead and just push it through. I thought it was something that wasn't a big deal. We weren't using that house. It's been set vacant for like 18 years anyways. So let's just go ahead and sell it. And then she sports back something along the lines of, well, if that's the type of church that we're going to be a part of where two men can just make whatever executive decision they want. Well, I think that we just might need to find a new church talking to her and her friends in that area. And they then sparks are flying. This is the first business meeting I have ever been a part of as, as a pastor. And I have no idea what to say or what's going on. Finally, the conversation ends with something along the lines where Chuck says, well, regardless of what we should have done, the house is already sold and there it is in the financial report, so a motion to approve it. And that was how that meeting went. And uh, then it went, Pastor, would you pray us out? What do you pray for? <laughs> like, God, pray for more peace. In this. Have you ever been in those situations where things are just tense and you have like nothing, you're just there in, in the tensity of the situation? I think, I think tension can be a pretty unenjoyable aspect of life, a pretty unenjoyable one, which, which stinks because, according to the Bible, it's a pretty normal aspect of life for those that follow Jesus. This is what we've been talking about over the past three weeks as we've examined Daniel's life in exile in Babylon and compared it to our life today. Because if we're living in this stage of exile where the cultural norms of the church clash against the cultural norms of society, then likeliness is you're going to find some tension in there. You're going to find tension with your family. You're going to find tension in the workplace. You're going to find tension in the Walmart checkout line when you read magazine headlines. You're just going to find Tension, because we live loyal to Jesus, or at least we're supposed to live loyal to Jesus in a culture today which largely does not. So the question is, how do we live in that tension? And I think this is what Daniel 3 is talking a lot about. So let me summarize a bit of it. We're going to really look at the whole chapter, but for time, uh, 
For time's sake, uh, I'll start in verse 16 and kind of summarize up until that point. So King Nebuchadnezzar uh, is still ruling over Babylon, and he gets this decision, this, this point in his leadership that he decides he's going to build a 90-foot golden statue, and he's going to ask the entire nation's leadership to come and bow down to this statue where everyone can see. So he brings in all the governing leaders of Babylon, uh, and this is not just Babylonians. Remember, Babylon is amazing at conquering other nations, taking that nation's best and brightest people that they can find, and then bringing them back to Babylon, putting them through this kind of cultural indoctrination three-year program, and then appointing that person as leader over the exiled nation. It was far better than just conquering people. It helped people to assimilate into Babylonian way of life. So these leaders are not just Babylonians. They're probably Egyptians, and, and they're absolutely Israelites, at least the three we see here. And even more than that, Assyrians and more people. So he's going to bring all of these leaders together. And we're going to have this moment with celebration and fanfare and music uh, to, to complete orchestra, which is going to be a good opportunity for all of Babylon to practice community as everyone bows down to this 90 foot statue. So everything comes together, it comes into order, and you get the 90 foot statue down on this plane where everyone is around it and can see it. And the music starts playing and everyone starts bowing. And I mean, envision from, from what I can best study, thousands of people standing around. You're talking like a football stadium of people bowing down to this, except for there's these three guys that don't. The text calls them Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's their Babylonian names. It's the one we most use. They refuse to bow down. Now, according to the text, it actually looks like the king is not even aware of this. And that's why we imagine this is a giant crowd, because it's so big that Nebuchadnezzar doesn't notice three guys who don't bow down. Of course, the guys behind them notice pretty quickly. And so these guys, the, the Chaldeans or the wise men, depending on your translation, they go to the king and they tattletale uh, to King Nebuchadnezzar. Hey, these three guys aren't doing what you asked them to do. But I think it's really interesting because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they, they don't get bullhorns and protest the egotistical king. They don't get picket signs and go, they just don't participate. And yet now they're taken before the king to report to what decision they've made. And we'll pick up in verse 16 with that. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king. So the king calls them into question. And they replied to the queen, king, Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to give an answer to you to this question. If the God we serve exists, then he can rescue us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he can rescue us from the power of you, the king. But even if he does not rescue us, we want you to know, or we want you as king to know, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden statue that you have set up. A couple things that I think are important here. Number one, notice that they're very respectful to the king. It's never, hey, Nebuchadnezzar, you egotistical maniac, it's ridiculous that you would ask people to do something like this, dial it back a few notches. Of course, they would have just died. That's what tries to happen to them anyways. But regardless, they're very respectful. They say, your majesty, and they refer to him as the king. They notice his position of authority. They, they never attempt to criticize him. In fact, in verse uh, 18, it says, well, sorry, verse 16, Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego replied, we don't need to give you an answer to this question. Your translation, if you have another one, might say, we don't need to give a defense. They don't even feel the need to defend themselves. They just say, hey, this is not who we are, and it's not what we're going to do. No critiques, no rude protest, just we will not participate. And they make this observation where they compare their trust in Yahweh, the one true God, to the power of King Nebuchadnezzar. And they suggest that, Rather trust that they would rather trust God than trust him, regardless of what the outcome is. And so while they never assume to know God's purpose or have any authority to make God do what they want God to do, they absolutely know and trust God's ability. And it leads them to trust in his obedience. So I, I love that phrase. This is why I focus so much here on verse 18 when, he's, when they say, but even if he does not rescue us, we want you to know that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden statue you have set up. It leads them to trust in obedience, and they do that even if their obedience doesn't result in deliverance. That's the type of dedication they are giving to God. And so the story goes on in verse 19, then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with rage, 
And the expression on his face changed towards Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It goes from this civil discussion to just a moment of where he is so irate and angry. He gave orders to heat the furnace seven times more than was customary. That's a Hebrew idiom to use that term seven to say as hot as it will possibly go to the complete maximum part. And he commanded some of the best soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the furnace. So notice, he's so mad that he takes even his best soldiers, puts their life at risk, and they actually end up dying, we later find out, because of how hot this furnace is, because he's so mad at these three Israelite men. He risks everything, he gets angry. So these men, verse 21, in their trousers, robes, head coverings, and other clothes, were tied up and thrown into the furnace of blazing fire. Since the king's command was so urgent and the furnace so extremely hot, the raging flames killed those men who carried Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego up. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the furnace of blazing fire. And so we ask the question, does God deliver them? It's actually kind of a complicated question, right? Because... Right here, if we stop to this point, the answer is no. They fall into the fire. And then we get to verse 24. Then King Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in alarm and he said to his advisors, didn't we throw three men bound into the fire? Yes, of course, your majesty, they replied to the king. And so he exclaimed, look, I see four men not tied walking around in the fire unharmed. And the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Now, this is the point that a lot of us will stop in churches and we'll look at that and say, this is what we call a Christophany, which I think is actually very likely. Uh, Christophany is the point where Jesus uh, comes in his human form before being born to Mary in the New Testament, because we know Jesus is eternal. He, he is fully God. And so Jesus being eternal has the ability to enter into the Old Testament but the text doesn't exactly say that. It would have no way to say that because Daniel wouldn't have had a concept of who Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, was at this point in history. But at whatever it is, um, there's something noticeable there. And I think the point with all of this is that God's presence is physically noticeable in the middle of this fire. That, that God is absolutely in this fire with him in an undeniable way. So we get to verse 26, and Nebuchadnezzar then approached the door of the furnace of the blazing fire and called Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you, you servants of the Most High God, come out. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. There's more that goes on here. But I think it's interesting because does God deliver them from the fire? Well, no, but also yes. And there's so much that can be discussed through this. We could talk about how God delivers through unexpected ways. I think there's a point in this text that really applies to that. You could talk about how, how do we deal with ungodly authoritative figures. That's a part of this text. Um, how to not bow down to 90 foot golden statues. I think that's a part of it. And all of that is good and helpful. But I think if we can dig under the surface in the context of this a little bit. We find that this is actually not just some anecdotal story to give you encouragement for when life's kind of hard and you just need to have the, the assurance that God's in the hard, difficult things with you. That's there, and that's definitely in other parts of the Bible as well. But there's something more that goes on to this. And if we dig under, we find it's actually far more intrusive than what a lot of us are comfortable with. And that's what I want to attempt to do. If we're going to talk about how we as Christ followers are to live in tension... Then, then I need to try to see if I can draw the attention to the tension. That's a lot of same words there in a way that you can maybe feel because this story is about embracing tension when living in exile. So here, here's kind of the key point that we're going to start off with today. Resolved exiles live in tension. Now, if you'll remember, we've been using that word resolved because in chapter 1, verse 8, uh, as Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego are all put into this indoctrination school program, uh, chapter 1, verse 8 says that Daniel resolves not to defile himself. And so we're saying that we want to have that type of resolve as exiles in modern culture. And so if we're going to be those types of resolved exiles, it's going to mean that we live in tension. Well, how do we get to that? Well, I think the best way is to start all the way back with what is this statue of? What's the statue that's being built by Nebuchadnezzar of? Now, there's debate over what it may be. There's people that will say, well, maybe it's a statue of Nebuchadnezzar himself. 
Maybe it's a replica of the statue that he sees in his dream in Daniel chapter 2. Maybe it's some particular Babylonian god. The reality is the text doesn't tell us what the statue is, but I think it does give us a clue. And that clue is found in verse 14. So if you take Daniel chapter 3 and look at verse 14, it says this. Nebuchadnezzar addresses Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and he says, Is it true that you don't serve my gods or worship the gold statue I have set up? Now, the, the, the word that we're kind of playing with here is that word or in the Hebrew. It's just one letter. It's the Hebrew letter Vav. And it has this really big semantic range. In fact, if you were to look it up, it's one of the most common, if not the most common Hebrew word in the Bible. And it can mean and, it can mean or, it can, it's, it's a lot of different things. But uh, Tim Keller, in, in his kind of commentary over this, suggests that the clearer translation is actually to use the word by. So historically, we translate it or, but you could also translate it. Is it true that you don't serve my gods by worshiping the golden statues that I have set up? So the translational difficulty is, is it the English word or, or is it by? And the context would imply that or tends to put a separation between these two actions. That you can be serving, serving the Babylonian gods, or you can be bowing down to the 90-foot statue. But those are two separate things. But I think the context of Daniel chapter 3 implies that actually both of these things are happening at once. Because if you go up into the beginning parts in verses 4 and 5, when the king is giving the decree, the decree is not serve the Babylonian gods and bow down to the statue. The, the command is just bow down to the statue. So I know I'm kind of in the weeds technically over here, but let me draw it to this point. If these two things are actually one in the same, that you serve the Babylonian gods by bowing down to the statue, that you bow down to the statue in service to the Babylonian gods, then this would clue us into the significance of what this statue represents. That the significance of this statue is probably not to one particular Babylonian god. Otherwise, the text could have easily said, and there was a statue built of the god Marduk or uh, Nebu. We, we know those Babylonian gods. The text makes reference to them from time to time. It probably wasn't of Nebuchadnezzar himself. Babylonian thought didn't fully equate kingship to deity like the Egyptians had done. So it's unlikely that he would have built a statue of himself. So I think what this lands at is what most scholars agree on is that this statue is some symbolic image representing the nation of Babylon as a whole. It's the combination of political power of King Nebuchadnezzar endorsed by the religion of the Babylonian gods. It's religifying. I looked that up. That's actually a word. It's religifying Babylon, the nation. The way we've come to talk about this in more modern times in English is the concept of what we call civic religion. So in civic religion, uh, I have a slide just to kind of show you what, what I mean by this. Civic religion is the attempt to make a nation's character sacred and its leaders or her leaders, uh, saints or, or heroes. And then it functions on three convictions from there. So the first conviction is something along the lines of the belief that this particular nation has been selected by some divine right, chosen by God, chosen by the gods. So the gods have chosen Babylon to conquer and bring peace to the known world. It's clear by the power Nebuchadnezzar has displayed. He is chosen. Babylon is chosen by this civic religion. The second convince, uh, conviction then is that this nation and her leaders thereby become agents of the gods or God's divine rule. So it's this uh, culture's, this nation's, this king's responsibility then to bring God's will or the God's will or salvation or presence. So wherever Babylon has conquered, the Babylonians' gods rule, giving them, particularly Nebuchadnezzar, the power and authority over everyone else. Which leads to the third conviction is then that that nation thereby becomes the manifestation of divine blessing to the world. I know I'm deep here, but fo follow this out with me. If you want peace and flourishing, if you want to live the good life, well, then you need to entrust the way of Babylon, bow down and worship this statue. Just do things the way we do things. And I promise we'll provide you with peace and prosperity and all the things that the gods have given Babylon to provide to this world. Oh, and if you don't, we'll throw you into a raging fire. But come on, just do, do what we want you to do. 
And that's an anthropologic pattern all throughout history. That's not something by any means that's just limited to Babylon. In fact, uh, here's an inscription found on a government building from 6 BC. So this is before Jesus about Caesar Augustus. It says this, the most divine Caesar, we should consider equal to the beginning of all things. For when everything was falling into disorder and tending toward dissolution, he restored it once more and gave the world a new aura. The beginning of life and vitality has brought our life to the climax of perfection, being sent to us and our descendants as Savior. He has put an end to war and has seen uh, set all things in order. Do you see the civic religion of Rome being played out in this? Right, right. The idea that Rome has this divine right granted to it, that the most divine Caesar has been sent to put an end to war. Or the gods have chosen Rome as a nation to be the means by which peace comes to the world. Thereby, Rome and, and its counter leaders, its counterpart Caesar, is the agent by which the gods bring salvation and presence through the known world, being sent to us by the gods as Savior. Meaning then, Rome's duty is to be the manifestation of divine blessing to the world. That he's brought life to the climax of perfection. So anyone that would trust Caesar as king can know what it means to live in peace. Also, if you don't, we'll break your kneecaps. But trust Caesar as king. Do you see the theme lining out through this? This is Pax Romana. Now, luckily, right, that's just a thing of the past. It's a pattern from antiquity. And really, it has no bearing on how nations motivate populations today. Well, except for there was that one time in 14th century Spain where the monarchy, Ferdinand and Isabella, in war with the Turks, said, we are convinced that the Lord has chosen us to carry out this great enterprise in reference to Spain. And then just a couple hundred years or a hundred years later, uh, Miguel de Cervantes, the author of Don Quixote, if you've read that, he writes, Spain is a chosen nation destined to achieve great things. At the same time, there's a uh, Spanish poet, Fray Luis de Leon. He writes a poem and it says, Spain is the land of saints and heroes chosen by God to play a special role in history. Of course, you could also go up to England at the very same time. There's a clergyman in England named John Fox. He wrote this. England is God's peculiar people chosen by him for special favor and blessing. Germany, around the 1800s at this point, there's a leader named Otto von Bismarck, a political leader. He writes, Germany is God's chosen people, which undeniably has influence on the upcoming leader, Adolf Hitler, when he writes his book, Mein Kampf. And in Mein Kampf, Hitler will write things like, I believe today that my conduct is in accordance with the will of the almighty creator, which is appalling to think about, but that's what he writes. Later on in the book, he says this, what we have to fight for is the necessary security of the existence and increase of our race and people, meaning the German Aryan race, and the substance of its children and the maintenance of our racial stock unmixed, the freedom and independence of the fatherland, which is just a horrible statement in itself. But then he follows that statement up by saying this, that our people may be enabled to fulfill the mission assigned to it by the creator. Do you see the irony in that? That we have been endowed with God's rights to make these decisions of murder and Holocaust. And that's that's how Hitler writes. Here's my point. Limiting Daniel 3 to a mere children's story and then wiping the sweat off of our brow. Because luckily, no one this week is going to try to make you bow down to a 90 foot statue totally misses what this story is getting at. It misses the far more human problem that every believer in God faces with the temptation to elevate nation to God as if it is the same thing. Throughout human history, political leaders have attempted to impute this type of religious zeal into a particular movement or party or candidate, importing this messianic hope to that movement, that party, or that candidate, as if that is the only or they are the only solution and only hope for a better tomorrow. That's exactly what King Nebuchadnezzar does in Daniel chapter 3. By pointing his, by this point, his empire stretches across the known world. And he needs to find some way to bring all these different backgrounds together. So what should they put their hope in? Well, they should put their hope in Babylon. They should put their hope in me. In fact, I will set it up to where they all bow down to my nation, my authority, my gods. And how do you make that happen? Well, overtaking and forcing your religion on others through forceful oppression has almost never really worked out. So he provides a far more sneaky proposal. Because in Nebuchadnezzar's mind, it's not that you have to stop worshiping whatever God you prefer in private. 
Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Daniel, they're all welcome to go pray to their God as they see fit in their privacy of their own homes. It's just when you're in public, you just need to go ahead and acknowledge these gods. Pray to your gods in private. Acknowledge these gods in public. And the modern temptation is no different today. Sure, you're not going to be asked to bow down to some golden statue, but you will be asked to privatize your faith for the conviction of the sakes of whatever public entity you insert here. And likeliness is, if you refuse to bow down to that in whatever form that means, then there's going to be some consequence you have to pay. Welcome to the tension of living for Jesus in a world that doesn't. And there's a whole list of things that we could fill into that blank. But I want to highlight two in particular that I think uh, deals most with us in our modern time with our allegiance to Jesus. The first one is what I'm just going to call nationalism. Nationalism is the tendency to idolize nation and government to the position of God. Now, understand this. That is not the same as being proud of your home and thankful for where you come from and thankful for the freedoms that you have. Those things are not the same thing. There's nothing sinful about knowing where you come from. There's nothing sinful in celebrating where you come from. The Bible always allows you to have the heritage of your nationality in a good way. When Philip leads the Ethiopian eunuch to Jesus, the Ethiopian eunuch does not just become the eunuch. He stays Ethiopian. It's okay. That's a good thing to celebrate and have. The problem lies in elevating the nation as if America is synonymous with the kingdom of God. So here's a quote Uh, by an Old Testament scholar named Tremper Longman. If you ever take an intro to Old Testament class, you're likely going to read his book on the Old Testament. He says this in his commentary over Daniel. As I lost my place in my notes. He says, we need to remind ourselves that no modern nation, whether America, England, Korea, or wherever, is in a situation like Israel. America is more like Babylon in Daniel's day or Rome in Jesus' day. Now, Hear me out. That's not to say America is evil. That's not the point of this text. And it's not to say God cannot or has not used America in some really good ways. In fact, both Babylon and Rome have been heavily or were heavily utilized by God in his plan to bring Jesus and his plan to communicate that gospel. It's Babylon's use that the prophets talk about over and over again that God would use them to punish Israel. In a lot of ways to bring destruction because they didn't repent. It's Rome's ability to tie all of these nations and towns together through Roman roads and the ability to have a universal language that gives the early church ammunition to see an explosive growth within the church that Paul could write a letter in the exact same language to Rome or to Corinth or to Thessalonica and they could all read it and comprehend it. God uses them. So that's not to say that God has not used America in incredible ways, but it is to say God or America is not God's chosen means to bring salvation to the world. And to attempt to worship nation as if it were God's chosen means is to bow down to the golden statue of nationalism. Jesus is God's chosen means to bring salvation to the world. And the church is God's chosen means to bring the world to Jesus. The Christian citizenship, allegiance, and loyalty always goes to Jesus first. It always goes to Jesus first. Here's another. I know I'm doing a lot of quotes today, but I've found this really fun in studying it. This is a letter um, written in Greek in about 200 AD. Um, and, And so it's written by a Christian to a pagan trying to explain why Christians act the way they act. And here's what it says. So this is 200 years, early church. Christians are not distinguished from the rest of humanity by country or by speech or dress. For they do not dwell in cities of their own or use a different language, nor do they practice a peculiar way of life. For while they live in both Greek and barbarian cities and follow local customs and dress and food and other aspects of life, at the same time, they demonstrate the remarkable and admittedly unusual character of their own citizenship. They live in countries as their own, but simply as sojourners. They share in the life of citizens, and they endure the lot of foreigners. Every foreign land to them is a homeland, and every homeland a foreign land. They spend their existence on earth, but their citizenship is in heaven. If we're going to live in tension with the culture around us, we have to understand that this culture is actually not our home. 
That our citizenship remains to God, our allegiance goes to God, our loyalty goes to God, and then everything cascades from that first, and so we're held in that constant tension. So it means we cannot elevate nation to the point of God. So that's the first thing. The second thing I want to talk about is the concept of what what I'm going to call hedonism. It's the idea that, uh, so if nationalism is the problem of bowing down to the golden statue of state, hedonism is the problem of bowing down to the golden statue of self. It's elevating my happiness, my feelings, my autonomy to the position of God. And while I think, and this is a very general statement, so don't take this personally by any means, but just very generalizing. While I think nationalism kind of creates more tension with the generation above 40, hedonism creates a lot of tension with the upcoming generation. And this one's a little bit more complicated because it's far less institutionalized. There's no formal rallies for hedonism. Like, well, let's come have a rally for hedonism today. Like you might find some political rally for nationalism. Instead, you have these little small hubs of power. And they're just subtly inviting you to participate. So it's going to be things like, just have another drink. Life's short and you've worked really hard this week. You deserve a reward for that. Just just bow down, have another drink. Just just sleep with whoever you want. You're free and it's fulfilling. Explore yourself and those inner feelings and then express them however you see fit. Come on, just, just bow down. Do whatever feels good. Oh, come on, you can watch that show. How would you ever be able to carry on a conversation in today's world without, when everyone's talking about that, that particular thing if you don't participate? Yeah, I know the scenes are pretty well full-on pornographic, but, but you're above that and that really doesn't affect you. Just watch it. Bow down. It's just entertainment. Oh, man, that jacket. It's so cute on you. I mean, I know it's only $145. And you got three of them that look the exact same at home. But we all need a little shopping therapy every now and again. It's your money. You earned it. Spend it how you want. Just just bow down to consumerism and make that purchase. Welcome to the world where everything competes for your loyalty and allegiance to Jesus. From nation to corporation, from enterprise to entertainment, from cultural norms that nobody has to know. But if you're going to live in this modern world, then you are going to be asked over and over again to table your religion to the private parts of your life and bow down to this public way that we live in this culture today. You can give your allegiance to both Jesus and whatever else might be on the table. So the question is do you feel that tension? Because if you don't, well, there's a good chance that you're probably bowing down to some golden statue somewhere. And I would just say God's not okay with your shared allegiance. God is not honored or glorified in the ability to serve both him and something else as if it were the same. God is a jealous God and he wants your allegiance and loyalty to him, not him and. So what do we do? If we're going to live in this tension, how do we live in it? And there's a lot that can be said, but just holding to the example here in Daniel 3, here's how I want to say it. We live in tension through non-participation. Exile, resolved exiles live in tension through non-participation. See, that's the remarkable part of this story, I think. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they just refuse to participate while remaining constantly kind and respectful and compassionate. And I think that's astounding. I think one of the coolest uh, and best modern examples of this, although it does not end in the same way this text does, uh, is a story of a guy named August uh, Landmesser. I know I keep using a lot of references to Nazi Germany today, but here's, here's a picture from 1936. This is a, uh, and you can probably barely see up here in the right corner. This is a, uh, zoom it in for you a little bit. I wanted you to see how big it was first. But this is a Nazi rally uh, to Hitler. And you can go back one more picture just to see the whole big thing. And you can see all of this sea of people listening to Hitler speak and doing the Hail Hitler salute to to him. And right there in this sea of people, now we'll zoom in one more time. You see this one guy just standing there with his arms folded. Um, There's a couple theories. We don't know exactly who this is, but the leading theory is that this was a guy named August Landmesser. uh, And he was 26 years old and just was choosing not to participate. Story goes that it looks like he was uh, illegally dating a Jewish girl, which makes sense for a 26-year-old to be like, yeah, she's way more important than you, Hitler. Sorry. It's just how guys work. Um, But he's dating this Jewish girl, and so he chooses not to participate. The story kind of changes into tragedy because he then formally gets charged, as this comes to be found out, with, quote, dishonoring the race. 
He was imprisoned. She was caught and later killed in a concentration camp alongside 14,000 other Jewish women. He was then forced drafted in a penal battalion as a punishment and was killed in Croatia in battle. And I know that's dramatic and it's a big example up there. But I think it sets an example even here for us today. That even in a crowd cheering and saluting, whatever idol prevails in culture, be it political, secular, or personal, we as loyal followers of Jesus simply should pledge our allegiance to the one true king of the universe and say, we're just not going to participate. Everyone around me can do the salute, but I'm not. Whatever the cost is, I pledge my loyalty to Jesus. Now, for many of us, that's going to be far more ordinary. Sorry, I'm just not going to act like that politician is the savior of the world. I think there's only one person that's the savior of the world and his name's Jesus. Sorry, I, I'm just not going to have that drink. Actually, I believe intimacy is sacred and reserved for a man and woman in a covenantal relationship with one another. So if that's what you're looking for in a relationship, you probably want to go date someone else. Sorry, I, I can't come to the watch party for that show. I just really try to not let those images enter into my mind. I don't really know if I need that jacket. It's, my money could be better utilized to care for someone that maybe doesn't have any jackets at all. And none of that is about being arrogant or uppity or feeling like we're so much more holy and righteous than everyone else. It's not to be done with some superiority complex. It's merely the quiet rebellion against the status quo. And that will demand critical thought and meticulous consideration on how we live in tension. But if we want to change culture from a position of exile, it will demand us not participate in certain cultural norms when it feels like, even when it feels like every other person around us is saluting and bowing down in worship. Welcome to the tension of exiles. And this is a tension that's sure to upset people. Because it doesn't matter how kind and respectful you are, non-participation always carries the critique of the status quo, which is often taken as offensive. So you might very well upset those who are pretty well um, loyal to the civic religion. You might upset those obsessed with hedonistic secularism because to say no is in effect to say that's wrong and it's probably going to cost you. Non-participation may very well cost you a friend or a cell or a job promotion or just the job in itself. But it's in the face of a threat like that that we're called to repeat verse 18. But even if he does not rescue us, we want you to know, King, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden statue you have set up. Because here's the question. Can I trust God will do more with my faithfulness than the culture will do with my compliance? Even if my faithfulness puts me in a more difficult situation. Because what we find in the Gospels is actually the difficult situation where God does his greatest work. It's actually the crucifixion, the death of Jesus, where the entire world is offered salvation. It's actually the fiery furnace where Nebuchadnezzar sees the ever-present reality of these Israelite guys, God, in person. This is where God does his work. So we live in tension, and even when the difficult situations come, we say, we will not bow, whatever it costs. And then we trust that God can use that faithfulness far more than the culture wants your compliance. So what do you need to get Go on and just opt out of. Maybe it's a conversation with your roommates. It has to be, hey guys, can you just not watch that show when I'm around? They're probably going to get mad at you, but I just really don't want to see stuff like that. Maybe it's deleting that app off your phone or getting off social media or not going to that party or that rally. And it's just swearing allegiance to Jesus and Jesus alone. Because what does it look like when we as First Baptist are not loyal to anything man-made but are loyal only to God. I'm telling you, it'll look different than anywhere else in this world. But that's who God wants us to be. Because resolve, exile, live in that tension through non-participation. So what do you need to do to come give your loyalty back to Jesus? We have a few minutes for you to just pray over that and think, what is my loyalty going to? And if there is anything competing with your loyalty to Jesus, how do you lay that aside? Now I end here, maybe you've not given your loyalty to Jesus in the first place. Maybe it's time to come in and just, what we say at this point, have you ever made Jesus Lord over your life? Which that's really weird. We don't, that's a very Christian statement. All that means is, are you willing to say that Jesus has the authority? 
That he is the one you pledge your allegiance to and your loyalty to above all else, above everything else, because he is the one that deserves it as your creator and your savior. If you have never done that, I would love to talk with you right here. But what you need to just refuse to participate in because we pledge allegiance to Jesus. 